actually in tradition. And I'm finding it very difficult to get mind shifts to put that towards policy, to actually, even a pig gets comfortable in mud. <laughs> For example, with the schools, it's obvious that we're gonna have to close schools somewhere down the road. There, there's no way around that. But when you, again, it's tradition versus policy. Good policy says we're gonna need to do this, but tradition says, hey, well, my dad, my cousin, my mom went there. And so there's an emotional attachment. That's what I bring different. I don't have that emotional attachment. Good business is good business. And we're gonna use that formula and we're gonna do that. Taylor, same question. I absolutely believe there's a tendency to stick to the status quo. And obviously I think to this point we can all agree that that hasn't worked, that we need change. And the world is changing quickly especially the world of education. And I think if we're gonna better prepare our students, if we truly want them to be the best that they can be, and we care about the future of this community, I think we have to try new things. We have to think different. We have to be innovative. And that's a perspective that I think I can really bring to the board. Woo! Margaret has spin off of that question. Should the district be doing more to train promising local educators for future administrative positions? And should the district be looking more outside for administrators with different approaches? Yeah, I think part of what is needed in terms of our own teachers is to have some type of site-based management, some type of system where we can have opportunities for advancement of our own. I think Dennis alluded to that, of us training our own. I think it's also great to have outside people on outside but I came in Pueblo, loving Pueblo. I came in Pueblo, hitting the community, working, working with the students, working, and I bring a different perspective. But it's one that I can bring to the table to say, hey, let's try this, let's try that. For instance, I, I'm not necessarily um, in favor of closing our schools. If we don't look at why we're losing the students, and we don't address those reasons we're losing them, we're gonna continue to erode down the road. So if we start closing, we're gonna be closing, closing, unless we find out what the problem is, and then move forward to do something about it. Woo! Donnie, same question. Will you repeat it, please? Sure. Should the district be doing more to train promising local educators for future administrative positions? And should the district be looking more outside for administrators with different perspectives? Oh, I totally believe in supporting the community, and I think that we do need to be teaching our, our educators who are here to be promising administrators. We are not listening to them, so right now, they don't really want to be administrators. I think that bringing outside people also helps because they do bring a fresh perspective. I come from a community that where the demographics are very, very similar to Pueblo, and it's nice to have somebody outside of the community who can still understand what is going on within our community. And if we do both of them together, then we're gonna have a better educated Pueblo and that's what we need. Woo! Kenneth, you'll have our next question first. Should each board member be allowed to speak to the public and media, or should most communications be routed through the board president? Uh-uh. Every single board member needs to be responsible and accountable to the constituency, to every single person here, every person that walks up to you. <clears throat> we should never be off limits. We are you. Yeah. A couple of months ago, I sat right there. I'm no different. So absolutely, I, I, I completely disagree with having any distance between us and the public. You cannot solve an issue if you don't know where the issue is, if you're not talking about it, if you're not face to face with somebody finding out what their issues are. You, you can't do anything about it. So absolutely, we need to be amongst our people doing what we need to be doing to solve these issues and getting help from them. Hey, what do you think the issue is? Hey, what do you think the answer is? I may not know it, but hey, I may listen to you and get a spark and get an idea. And together, we may solve those issues. So absolutely, absolutely. The answers reside right here with the people. Yeah. That's awesome. Yes, same question. Is that right? The, uh, the schools belong to the taxpayers. 
Uh, I intend to speak for 16,500 individuals, most of them too young to vote. Those are our students. I'm going to speak my piece when I think it should be spoken, and I will respect the common courtesy rules of governance in terms of when to speak out and when not, but I am not going to be told that I cannot speak up on a particular issue because it may be different than something that one of the other board members, or a matter of fact, the other four board members believe. So, in interest of transparency and gaining the respect and integrity of this particular community, we need to be able to speak out on what we see as the actual issues and not as what someone else thinks the actual issues are. Margaret, same question. Yes, I know there are times because of legal matters that we will not be able to as a board to give the public all the details by law, and that I'm sure you're aware of. But I think in order to involve you as one of our stakeholders, in order for you to feel like you're a part of what we're doing, we're going to have to speak to you. We're going to have to, <coughs> as a board, to let you know our vision, where we see ourselves going in the community. We're going to have to let you know the trends that are happening so that we can prepare to meet those demands. So I see that we work together as a team, and as a team, we're going to have to have integrity so we do what's right, and do we do have an opportunity to speak to the community as needed. Dottie, a spin-off of that question. Speaking of innovation, would it make sense for the board to not have a president, but instead merely rotate the duty of managing board meetings? I think that'd be a great idea. Um, right now, it seems that the person that's the president uh, resides over the rest of the board. And as a parent, looking in on these meetings and looking in at the school board, I don't appreciate it. I don't appreciate the fact that one person is the sole um, speaker for all of them. And I know that the board gets to speak, but quite frankly, it needs to rotate. We need to have somebody different every once in a while that, that has that voice to speak up. And especially somebody like me, when, if I was on the board, because I'm a parent, I can tell you exactly what's going on. And I can also tell you, it's not going to work. Stop it. So absolutely, because I want to be president. I think everybody <laughs> up here would like to be president of the board someday. And this will give us all an opportunity to do that. Woo! Taylor, same question. I don't think it's necessary for us to have to rotate people every single meeting. I think what we do have to do is build a culture where every single board member, not just the president, feels that they can provide their perspective and that they can share their ideas. And to me, that's not even a question. That culture should not be there. And if we as the board, people on the school board, are the bridge to the community, Every single one of those people has to be accessible. They have to be able to hear the community's ideas. And I think I don't think we can just limit that to one person as the board president. We have to really spread that out and allow people to provide their perspectives. Okay, Donnie, you'll answer this one first. And it may seem like a simple question, but what is your real assessment of the current quality of education offered to the Pueblo City Schools? Well, we moved here five years ago, and I do have, my kids are back there, um, kids in Pueblo City Schools, and I'm going to have a child in Pueblo City Schools until 2022. When we arrived here, I can tell you that it was kind of a shock because my kids were a little more advanced, coming from a different school, and they got a little bored, and, and then being in the classroom with those teachers, they just aren't given the resources that they need in order to teach right. I think that if you have happy teachers, you're going to have better educated students. And the overall culture with our, with our teachers right now, they, they feel disrespected, and they feel as if they don't have a voice. And I think that once we can listen to them and get, get a community and, and teacher coalition going, then maybe we can start figuring out how to make our education system better. But right now, it's it's in dire straits, and I think that we really need to work on on focusing on our children and just making Pueblo better.
Taylor, same question. I think our schools are in a bad place right now. And the evidence of that is the fact that families in the city don't want to keep their kids in public city schools. They move them to D70. I've heard of some people that have even moved to Springs just because they want to get a quality education for their kids. And then you have the other side of it where people coming to Pueblo look up our schools on the internet. And you won't find anything good about our schools on Google. <coughs> so I think our students absolutely deserve the highest quality education possible. That we are responsible for providing them that. And with that, I think we also have to do a better job once we start making progress of communicating that progress and that success with not only our community, but communities around us for the people coming here. Because that's also a huge problem too. Dennis, same question. It's a rather difficult question. Uh, the dedicated teachers that I know in this community are outstanding and the students that are in their classes are getting the highest quality education that they can. I'm a real cynic of certain testing requirements and what they really show up in our children. I will guarantee you this, however, that a lousy teacher is the most overpaid person in the United States. The good, excellent <laughs> teacher is the most underpaid professional in the United States. I believe that there is a perception out there right now that Pueblo City Schools is not providing the quality education it can to its students and in this day of choice, people are ex exercising that choice. But I will guarantee you this, if given the opportunity to serve on this board, those standards will raise and our kids will come to school because it will be the school of their choice in Pueblo City Schools. Woo. Okay, Kenneth, a related question. How do we evaluate teachers and educational programs? <laughs> well, before I, uh, before I was on the board, I'm not sure how they, uh, they evaluated folks. And uh, we had the opportunity to evaluate our superintendent recently. Um, wasn't really a fan of how we did that. When I was in the Army, we used to evaluate our soldiers, evaluate our educators. Uh, I was actually director of education, of hospital education at Evans Army Community Hospital. And so I evaluated my folk, my, my teachers, my, my people. What I did was I went up on base, and I actually got the, the support forms, the new book, the guidelines of how Department of Defense evaluates its instructors. We now have that here in Pueblo City Schools. We'll be using that next year, because what we're using right now clearly does not work. Policy and administration, that's our weak point in District 60. I can tell you that straight up. That's, that is our weak point. If you can't fix your core, then everything is going to be broken. Thank you. Margaret, same question. Can you repeat the question, sure. please? How do we evaluate teachers and educational programs? Well, unfortunately, um, test results have been a great determiner for the public about teachers. But if you go into the classrooms as I go in, you will see these teachers dealing with the very challenging populations in many places. I have the ability to work with the students who need IEPs, 504s, RTIs. And in one classroom, if I can quickly tell you, I saw students with the most challenging behaviors I've seen in a long time. But I saw that teacher continue to work. She stayed focused on the subject. She, she rotated around that classroom. Part of my training is a teacher assessment and observation. I commend to her at the end how she managed to manage all those behaviors as well as keep them focused on the lesson. Now someone else come in that classroom probably and say, oh my goodness, look at that child sitting on that chair. But if you watch how she handled them, then you will see that she did a great job. So I think some of the assessment we use do a disservice to actually what our teachers are really doing in the classroom. Our next question, Taylor? Some would argue that the public perception of the current school board is one of dysfunction. 
Would you agree with that perception? If so, how would you address it? I would agree with that perception. Um, I've met with a lot of people in the community, a lot of parents, a lot of teachers, a lot of administration, and I haven't seen consistency. And to me, because the reason that is, it's like that is that the doors of communication are not open. We're not transparent, we're not communicating enough, and I think we have to involve all stakeholders at every single level. And we really have to get the input from everybody in the community and everybody in the district because nobody is on the same page. And to me, that is evidence of dysfunction. And I think for us to do that, we really have to communicate better. And we have to make that a priority. Woo. Dottie, same question. Well, as one of the people that is in the public and has kids in the school, uh, the perception is definitely one of dysfunction. Um, you have people that appoint superintendents that she was the sole candidate. Um, that's a bit dysfunctional. Um, as far as what to do about it, my, my goal is to get rid of the people that are on the board right now and put new and innovative people on, on it because they've done a lot to damage the reputation of Pueblo and the perception of Pueblo, and that dysfunction cannot continue to go on. That good old boy network cannot continue to go on. So yes, I think that we need to just scrap the board and start from scratch. Woo! Kenneth, same question. Well, I'm on the board. And I can... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I agree with you. There is on the if there's one thing, let me tell you, I'm a soldier. I have integrity. Woo. Never in a day. There is absolutely dysfunction. And I'll give you an example. I talked to some folks um, in Texas. They approached me about saving money for our schools. Solar power. The company's called Solar Hawks LLC down in Houston, and they believe that they can save us $9.3 million over the next 25 years. I submitted that to the doggone board, and what happened with it? The president of the company was, after he bought his ticket to come in and present it, was told, don't come. That's the kind of thing that happens on this board. That's the type of dysfunction that happens on this board. So yeah, absolutely it's dysfunctional. When you don't even want to listen to someone who is trying to help you to move in a, in a good, positive direction, you're darn right. It's got to be dysfunction. That needs to change. Woo! Yeah! Margaret, same question. You know, I, I have to say that um, I'm a little bit kind of mesmerized by your comments because <laughs> you're saying are new to me in terms of how the board is functioning. For instance, you're mentioning that you brought something to them and, and they did not listen. So those kinds of things I'm not aware of. I don't think that that is best practice. I think that we have to bring all the ideas to the table. In order for us to do a better job, we have to critically look at how we're doing what we're doing. And that means bringing the voices there. And if we disagree, we disagree. But let's disagree with knowledge rather than disagree because we're ignorant of the knowledge. Then we can make informed decisions. Dennis, same question. I uh, guess I'm curious, uh, and I would respectfully request for Mr. O'Neill to provide the date of that particular discussion uh, concerning the solar issues. Uh, and the reason I say that is that it appears to me, when we talk about dysfunction, that there are things that come before the public that seem to have appeared to have been discussed by the board, but not in a public meeting, which is a violation of the open meetings law. So I, I guess if, in fact, those kinds of discussions are going on, and I know Mr. O'Neill also mentioned that he proposed an 11-page or a 21-page proposal to the board, I don't recall anything being reported about those things. And so my question is, are these things being discussed outside the presence of the public in a meeting other than uh, a public meeting? I believe this board has been dysfunctional since the day they fired Dr. Constance Jones, lied about it, 
and never gave this community any rational explanation as to why she had to leave after she was improving the schools here in Pueblo. Woo! That wraps up the question and answer portion of the program, so we'll now go to closing remarks from each candidate. A reminder that each candidate will have two minutes uh, to have their closing remarks. But we'll reverse the order, and the order will be Margaret, Taylor, Kennedy, Dennis, and then Dottie. So, Margaret, you'll begin. Okay, I am the right person at the right time. I do hear a lot of uh, expertise coming from the other members here sitting beside me, but I know I bring experience, I bring education, I bring passion.